Hello, today we are going to be going through your guys' quarter three benchmark study guide. So the first one, the lengths of two sides of a right triangle are given. Find the length of the third side. Write the theorem and show the substitution. Round your answer to the nearest tenth if needed. So Pythagorean theorem, we know our theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, they tell us that a is 5.2, so I'm going to substitute 5.2 in for a. We don't know what b is, so we're going to leave it b. And then C is 11.3. All right, so after substituting in your numbers, you are then just going to solve it. So 5.2 squared is 27.04. The B squared is going to stay. 11.3 squared is 127.69. Uh, next up, to get b squared by itself, I need to move this 27.04 by subtracting it on both sides. So we get b squared equals 127.69 minus 27.04 is 100.65. And last step to get b by itself, opposite of squaring is square rooting. So the square root of 100.65 uh, rounded to the nearest tenth would just give us 10. All right, next one, uh, determine whether the triangle with the given side lengths is a right triangle. Uh, write the theorem and show the substitution. So in order for uh, three numbers to form a right triangle, it has to satisfy our Pythagorean theorem. So all that we're going to do is start with our theorem. We are going to substitute our numbers in and make sure your largest number, so in this case 20, is plugged in for C because that would be your hypotenuse. And then you're just going to keep simplifying until you see if the two sides equal each other or not. So if I do 12 squared, that's 144. 16 squared is 256. And 20 squared is 400. All right, and then I can continue simplifying my left side by taking 144 plus 256, and that would give me 400. So since 400 equals 400, that is a true statement, which means that it is going to form a right triangle. So we're going to do the same process with our next one over here. So again, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 12 has to be plugged in for c because that's the largest number. And then 5 and 8 are going to be the legs. So again, we're just going to keep simplifying until we figure out if the left side equals the right side. So 5 squared is 25, 8 squared is 64, and 12 squared is 144. Um, add up 25 and 64 and you get 89. So since 89 does not equal 144, this means that it is not a true statement and they are not going to form a right triangle. All right, this time we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to find the unknown lengths. Write the theorem, show the substitution, round to the nearest tenths if needed. So looking at our first triangle, I see that our legs are 6 and 11 because they are attached to my right angle. And then what we are trying to find is our diagonal, or in other words, the hypotenuse. All right, so we're going to start with our theorem again, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Your legs, 6 and 11, are going to be plugged in for a and b. And we are trying to find C, or in other words, the hypotenuse. So first step here is to simplify like normal. So 6 squared is 36. 11 squared is 121. I can continue simplifying by adding these together. So 36 plus 121 is 157. And then our last step to get C by itself is square rooting both sides. So the square root of 157 is going to give us 12.5, rounded to the nearest tenths. All 
All right, and then number five here. So I have nine as a leg. I have 12 as my hypotenuse, and then I am trying to find another leg. So again, start with your theorem. Your hypotenuse, 12, has to be plugged in for C. And then we're gonna plug in nine for one of the legs, and then we are going to find the other leg. All right, so first step is simplify. So nine squared is 81. 12 squared is 144. Now I'm going to get A by itself by subtracting 81 from both sides. So we get A squared equals, then 144 minus 81 is 63. And then again, our last step to get A by itself, opposite of squaring is square rooting. So the square root of 63 rounded to the nearest tenths is going to be 7.9. All right, next one. Bree is helping her neighbor wash outside windows. Her neighbor has a window that is 10 feet up the house. Bree places the base of the ladder five feet from the house. If Bree's ladder is 12 feet long, will she be able to reach the window? All right, so I like to draw scenarios uh, when it comes to word problems and Pythagorean theorem. So here's my house, and they say that there is a ladder leaning up against the side of the house. Uh, she has a window that is 10 feet from the bottom of the house, so this is going to be represented by 10. Uh, the base of the ladder is 5 feet from the house. And then Bree's ladder, so my hypotenuse here, the diagonal, is 12. So we are trying to figure out, using our theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we are trying to figure out if our c squared is going to be greater than or equal to the two legs, okay? So let's see if this works out or not. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. I am not going to insert in 12 yet in for C because I want to make sure that it's, it is going to reach the top of the window. Um, you also could not insert in 10 yet. So we'll do it that way. So we're not going to insert in 10 yet and we're going to see if our A value is going to be 10 or less because if it is, then that means that our ladder is going to reach the window. So I'm not going to insert in 10 yet. So I'm just going to insert in 5 for a leg. I'm going to leave another leg open for now. And then our hypotenuse is 12. All right, so first step, simplify. So 5 squared is 25. 12 squared is 144. To get b squared by itself, I'm going to subtract 25 from both sides. To get b squared equals, and 144 minus 25 is 119. And then square root both sides to get B by itself. So the square root of 119 is 10.9. So this means that with a 12 foot ladder, it can reach up to 10.9. So since the window is only 10 feet from the base of the house, that means that our ladder is going to reach the top. Uh, next page, we are going to graph each order pair, and then we're going to find the distance between the two points. So 2, 2, right 2, up 2, 7, 9, right 7, up 9. So we need to find the distance of a diagonal on a coordinate plane. So remember, you, there's no way that you can just count the distance of your diagonal. What you have to do is you have to create a right triangle because we can count our legs because of the horizontal and vertical distance. And then we can use our theorem to figure out what that diagonal is. So my bottom leg is one, two, three, four, five units. Uh, my height of a leg is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I'm going to use those numbers to find my distance. So we're gonna start with our theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 
Again, five and seven are the legs, so I'm gonna plug those in for A and B. Uh, five squared is 25. Seven squared is 49. I'm going to add my 25 and 49 together to get 74. And then last step to get C by itself is square rooting both sides. So the square root of 74 rounded to the nearest tenths would give me 8.6. All right, so doing the same process here. So negative 4, 0 is right here. Negative 7, positive 4 is right here. And then again, we're going to find that distance of the diagonal. So again, you cannot count to find the distance of the diagonal. You will have to create a right triangle, find the distance of the legs, and then use Pythagorean theorem to find that distance of your hypotenuse. So the, the bottom leg down here is 3. Uh, leg over here on the side is 4. And then again, we're just going to use our theorem to figure out the hypotenuse. All right, so 3 squared plus 4 squared, since those are the legs, is going to equal c squared. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. Add 9 and 16 together to get 25. And then square root both sides to get a hypotenuse of 5. All right, next one, a map is laid out like a coordinate plane. Uh, Tim's house is located at 3, 4. The local coffee shop is located at 3, negative 2. And the mall is located at negative 5, negative 2. Is Tim's house closer to the mall or the local coffee shop? Explain your answer using correct mathematical vocabulary. All right, so first thing is to uh, plot all my points here. So Tim's house is at 3, 4. So I'm going to put a T for Tim. Uh, coffee shop is at 3, negative 2, so I'm going to put a C for coffee shop. And then the mall is located at negative 5, negative 2. Alright, so notice how it does form that right triangle that we need. So the distance from the mall to the coffee shop is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 units. The, diff, diff, or the distance from Tim's house to the coffee shop is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 units. And then we are trying to figure out is Tim's house closer to the mall or the local coffee shop. So we know right now that the distance from his house to the coffee shop is 6. We need to find out this distance though from his house to the mall. So again, I'm going to have to use my Pythagorean theorem. Uh, my two legs are 8 and 6, so I'm going to plug those in for A and B. Simplify, 8 squared is 64, 6 squared is 36. Uh, 64 plus 36 will give me 100. And then square root both sides, and we get a distance of 10. So, is Tim's house closer to the coffee shop or the mall? So, he's 6 units away from the coffee shop, 10 units away from the mall. So, that means that he is closer. So, Tim is closer to the coffee shop because it's only 6 units away compared to 10 units away from the mall. And then we can also explain how we use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the distance from Tim's house, Tim's house to the mall.
All right, next one. Anna is wrapping a soccer ball for her brother's birthday. The soccer ball has a radius of 12 centimeters. Determine how much wrapping paper Anne will need to cover the soccer ball. So since we're talking about the amount of space on the outside, uh, that is talking about surface area. And since it's talking about a soccer ball, we are talking about a sphere. So we gave you guys the surface area formula for a sphere. So all that you guys need to do is plug in your numbers um, into the correct spots in the formula and then just solve it. So four is going to stay. They want us to use 3.14 for pi. And then they tell us that our radius is 12. So in your calculator, you're gonna take four times 3.14 times 12 squared. And that gives us a total surface area of 1,808.64. And then our units will be centimeters squared since we're talking about surface area and area is always squared. All right, next one here. Uh, Mario is building a sandcastle and has two molds. One is the shape of a cone and one is the shape of a square pyramid. The cone has a height of six inches and a diameter of three. The square pyramid has a side measurement of four inches and a height of 3.6. Which mold will hold the most sand? All right, so our first formula is the volume formula of a cone and our second formula is the volume formula of a square pyramid. So our task is to find the volume of both uh, molds here and then figure out which one holds the most. So our cone is one third times pi is 3.14. Uh, the cone has a diameter of three. So in order to get my radius, I need to cut three and a half. So that will give me 1.5. And then the height is six. All right, so again, I'm just plugging all of those numbers into my calculator and I'm multiplying. So one third times 3.14 times 1.5 squared times 6 it gives me a volume of 14.13. Uh, my square pyramid, so we're going to substitute our numbers in, so we're going to keep one third. Um, they tell us that the side measurements are 4, so this would be 4 squared times the height, which is 3.6. So again, I'm just going to plug those numbers in, so 1 third times 4 squared times 3.6 and that gives me a volume of 19.2 so which one holds the most sand well the square pyramid does All right, next one. Uh, Janice bought a sphere-shaped snow globe for her grandmother. The snow globe has a diameter of four. She has a cubed shaped box with the side measurements of six. Is the box big enough to hold the snow globe? Explain your answer. All right, so first step is finding the volume of the sphere and of the box. So our sphere is four thirds times 3.14. And our radius, they tell us diameter is four, so you have to cut it in half to get the radius. So half of four is two, and I'm gonna cube that. So four thirds times 3.14 times two cubed gives me a volume of 33.49. And then the box is a cube with side measurements of six. So to find that volume, since we know a cube has all equal side lengths and our volumes length times width times height, we're just gonna take six times six times six, which is 216. So is the box big enough to hold the sphere? Yes, it is. So to explain, we'll say the box's volume is 216 uh, cubic inches. The sphere's volume 
is 300 or 33.49 cubic inches. Thus, since the box has a larger volume, the sphere will fit inside of the box. Um, so next one's talking about congruency and similarity. Uh, congruent means same shape, same size, and similar means same shape, different size. So out of our four transformations that we taught you guys, there's only one of these that's similar and then the rest of them are congruent. So when you translate a figure, all that you're doing is you're sliding it. So if you're only sliding it, that means you're gonna have the same shape, same size, so those will be congruent. Reflections, you're just flipping a figure. So again, that will give you same shape, same size, so that's congruent. Uh, dilations, you are making a figure larger or smaller, so that does change the size, so that means that's similar. And then rotation, you're just churning it. So again, that will give you same shape, same size, so congruent. All right, and then thinking about that again down here, again, if it's same shape, same size, that's congruent. Same shape, different sizes, similar. So I see two different sizes here, but the same shape, so that's similar. And then here, I see the same shape, same size, so that would be congruent. Uh, next one here, identify the transformation performed on the figure to get its image. Uh, so looking at the first one here, I'm looking at my order pairs. Uh, X was at 1, 2, and then X prime was at negative 1, negative 2. So what happened was both X and Y got multiplied by negative 1. So I know a rule that tells me to multiply both X and Y times negative 1, and that is a 180 degree rotation. Uh, next one, I don't even have to look at the order pairs because I see two different sizes. So the only transformation that talks about enlarging or reducing a figure is a dilation. All right, uh, next one, triangle ABC is plotted on a coordinate plane. Find the coordinates of point B if the triangle is translated four units left and three units down. So I'm just going to look at only point B here, and then I'm just gonna count on my coordinate plane, four units left, so one, two, three, four, and three units down, one, two, three. So this is where B prime will end up at, and B prime would end up at negative three, positive two. All right, so we have the same triangle. Now they want us to find point C if it's dilated by a scale factor of two. So if you guys notice, point C is currently at five comma two. So if I dilate it by a scale factor of two, that means that I'm gonna multiply both values, X and Y, times my scale factor of two. So when I multiply both numbers by two, five times two is 10 and two times two is four. So C prime is gonna end up at 10 comma four. All right, same triangle. Now they want us to find the coordinates of point A if it's reflected over the Y axis. So our rule for reflecting over Y is you multiply your X coordinate times negative one. So looking at point A, A is currently at one one. So using my rule, if I multiply my x value times negative one, that's gonna give me negative one, and then I keep my y value. So a prime is gonna end up at negative one, one. 
and you can even double check to make sure that it's going to look like a mirrored image when you reflect it over the y-axis. Alright, next one here, triangle XYZ is plotted on a coordinate plane. Find the coordinates of point X if the triangle is rotated 180 and reflected over the X-axis. Alright, so I'm only worried about X here, so I'm going to get X's original position, which is at 1, negative 3. Uh, we are going to rotate it 180, so the rule for a 180 rotation is you multiply both values times negative 1. So 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. So that's the first rule. Uh, then we are going to reflect over the x-axis. So reflecting over the x-axis, that rule is you multiply y times negative 1. So x stays the same, so negative 1, but y, you're going to take that y value times negative 1. So 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, so that means x double prime is going to end up at negative 1, negative 3. Alright, another one here. Uh, find the coordinates of the image when it is dilated by a scale factor of 2 and then translated two units left and three up. Draw the two transformations on the given coordinate plane. All right, so I'm gonna start with my original uh, order pairs down here. So X is at one, negative three, Y is at three, zero, and Z is at negative one, negative one. Okay, so first thing we're doing is dilating by a scale factor of two. So whatever your scale factor is, you're multiplying both values times 2. So x prime, 2 times 1 is 2, negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, so x prime is going to end up at 2, negative 6. y prime, 3 times 2 is 6, 0 times 2 is 0, so y prime is going to end up at 6, 0. And then z prime, negative 1 times 2 is negative 2, negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. So z prime will end up at negative 2, negative 2. All right, and then from this figure, we are going to translate two units left and three up. So you're more than welcome to take all of your x values minus 2, all your y values plus 3, or you can just count on the coordinate plane. So we're going to go 2 left, 1, 2, and 3 up, 1, 2, 3. So here's y double prime, which is at 4, 3. Uh, 2 left, 1, 2, up 3, 1, 2, 3. So here's z double prime at negative 4, 1. And then x double prime, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. We'll be at 0, negative 3. Alright, so we first dilated it and then we translated it two left and three up. Alright, last page here is we are just identifying the transformations that happened. So from A to B, notice how it looks like a mirrored image. So that means that a reflection happened. And if you want to be specific, we can say reflected over y-axis. And then again, going from B to C, notice how again it looks like another mirrored image. So this was a double reflection. So it went over y and then over x. All right, next one. So I know one transformation for sure happened is a dilation because our figure got smaller, but we need to know how did CB end up as the height over here on the bottom. So the only thing that makes sense here is going to be a 180 rotation, but let's make sure that that happened. So you can pick a point, so like C is at negative four, negative four. So when I rotate it 180, that means it's going to end up at 4, 4. And then notice how 
it then ends up at 4, 1. So we know that some uh, type of movement happened from 4, 4 to 4, 1. Uh, then if I do my dilation, um, I know that that's not going to work out because if I dilate by a scale factor of a half, this would end up at 2, 2. So it's not a 180 rotation. Um, so let's try 90 counterclockwise and see if that works. So another thing too with the dilation is you can automatically see what your scale factor is. So if you guys notice, AC had a length of 4 and then A prime, C prime had a length of 2. So that means that we cut our uh, triangle in half here, which means we have a scale factor of a half. Okay, so I know for sure we have a dilation of a half. Okay, but now we just have to figure out how did it rotate. Okay, so let's try 90 counterclockwise. So again, C is currently at negative 4, negative 4. If I rotate 90 counterclockwise, I'm going to multiply Y times negative 1. I'm going I'm to flip-flop the values. So that would end up at 4, negative 4. Okay, well that one didn't work either. Because then when I do my scale factor of a half, that would be 2, negative 2. Okay, so this one should actually have a third transformation because when we rotate it 90 counterclockwise and then dilate it by a scale factor of a half, it ends up right here. So then we would just have to move it over, so slide it, so our third transformation would be a translation. And we would translate it to right and up one, two, three. Okay, and you guys can kind of see my work that I did. So I multiplied my y values times negative one, and then I flipped them, and then I dilated by a scale factor of a half, and that's how I ended up with this figure right here. Okay. All right, and then last problem here. So we started here and then we ended up from zero to one, one to two. So again, notice how from zero to one, it looks like a mirrored image. So that would be a reflection over, in this case would be X axis. And then notice how my triangle stayed the same shape like it didn't move or didn't flip or anything, it just slid over. So that means that would be a translation. And the translation, we just moved it to the left, one, two, three, four, five units. So X minus five and Y stay the same. All right, so that's your guys' study guide. If you have any questions, let your teacher know.